And uh, so let's get started now. So now we're coming to the idea of uh, mindfulness of breathing. Uh, and how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated to be very fruitful and beneficial? Uh, this is the critical question. Yeah, how do we do this? Uh, and uh, this, so this has two parts, this particular question. Uh, how to do it is, first of all, how to lay the foundation so that it becomes possible to do any kind of mindfulness of breathing. Uh, and then how to actually develop the mindfulness of breathing itself, yeah, the actual um, the, uh, the process, if you like. Yeah. What is the outcome of that process? How does that process work? Yeah. So two aspects to it, uh, and we will see those aspects as we uh, get into this. Uh, it is when a mendicant, uh, yeah, it always talks about mendicants in these cases, but you can uh, take it It's the same thing if you are not a mendicant, if you are a layperson, same thing. Yeah. Uh, gone to a wilderness, uh, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty hut. Uh, yeah, sits down cross-legged. Uh. So again, this is the, uh, as I mentioned before, the standard uh, ideas about when you want to get serious about meditation. You always go to a secluded spot. Uh, all of these things are have the idea of seclusion built into them. Uh. And uh, the uh, one of the Critical, one of the uh, ideas of seclusion, as you find it in the suttas, is that there's two degrees of seclusion. There's the kaya viveka and the chitta viveka. And the kaya viveka means that you place yourself in a secluded space. Uh, yeah? And that is the preliminary that is required for the mind to become secluded. So first of all, the body is secluded, and then the mind becomes secluded as a consequence. Uh, and the body being secluded just means that you take it away from the, all the hustle and bustle and problems and the sensuality of the world, take it out of the city, take it out of the village, take it out of the, uh, you know, the civilization, if you like, uh, and go back to uh, becoming a caveman or something like that. Uh, that's kind of, <laughs> that's what monks are in a sense. They kind of, sometimes they can call them cavemen, the monks, or, or maybe the nuns, uh, because uh, you, you like caves. Have you... Uh, if you go to India, you can go to Ajanta and Ellora in India, very famous uh, uh, Buddhist sites in India, not so far from uh, Mumbai, a little bit inland from Mumbai. You will find these spaces a few hundred kilometers inland. Uh, and uh, these are these really amazing caves cut out of the granite. Yeah, I think it's granite, actually. And uh, really remarkable with lots of... I mean, they're quite fancy caves. They have like Buddha statues that are cut out of the granite and have all kind of paintings in there. And this kind of whole hillside is just cave after cave after cave. And uh, this was done a few hundred years after the Buddha's time. These were kind of created for the Buddhist monastics. So in a caveman is not an entirely wrong description of a, of a monk. But be careful if you say that to a monk, you may not like that. So don't, don't say that kind of uh, too upfront, you know, be, be sensitive. <laughs> Say again? Not, my trip, not going to Elora and Ajanta. Uh, yeah. Why? Because it's not the four holy sites. I'm, I'm kind of very, uh, kind of very traditional Buddhist. Uh, yeah, go, to, the Buddha said, go to the four places. It did, did not say go to Ajanta and Elora. So I'm, I'm not going to Ajanta and Elora. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so again, you withdraw from society, you go to a cave or whatever. And then uh, when the body is withdrawn, then the mind also becomes withdrawn as a consequence. When the mind is withdrawn, means that the mind gives up the interest in the five senses and it gives up the five hindrances. That is what chitta viveka means. Yeah, The mind is secluded from that part of the world. And then, once you have done that, then you sit down. Yeah? So uh, mindfulness of breathing happens in a sitting posture. It does not happen really in any other posture. Um, you can, sometimes you can also do it if you are very skilled, you can do it while lying down. Lying down is a possibility, not ideal. It's very easy to lose your mindfulness a little bit, but it can sometimes be done. Walking, not, not really possible to do. It's very hard to do mindfulness of breathing while walking. Uh, so uh, because you have so much other things going on, it's very easy to get distracted and things. So it's not really, not really ideal at all. Um, and so you sit down. So it happens in the sitting posture. That's a useful thing to know right, right there. If you're walking, do something else. And then you have to be cross-legged. Yeah, if you're cross, not cross-legged, you can't be enlightened. 
No, that's not what it means. Uh, some, sometimes people, palanka is the Pali word, uh, yeah? And uh, sometimes people would argue you have to be cross-legged, but actually don't have to be cross-legged. Uh, this is just the uh, what was done at the time in India. And it is, you know, if, if you can sit cross-legged, it's very comfortable. But if you can't, then it's okay. You can have very good meditation in all kinds of postures. Uh, and I know a lot of uh, monks who have sit in all kinds of weird ways, and they have uh, <laughs> they still have good meditation. Uh, yeah. So um, it is. Uh, it can be done. Uh, so this is the um, the basis. Uh, then what? Uh, you set the body straight. Uh, this is the next one. Uh, so setting your body straight. Let me just get rid of all this extra text. I don't like extra text. I like to kind of focus properly. That's what I. That's what I like. Yes. Yeah. So now, no more extra text. Uh, set the body straight. Uh, yeah. The idea here is that when your body is straight, then. Uh, uh, mindfulness becomes clear. Uh, and uh, again, this happens often automatically. The body kind of straightens itself because it just feels nice. Uh, yeah? So you, when the mind is right uh, and you are at ease, then you set your body straight. Uh, don't force the body straight. Uh, don't try to be straight if it doesn't feel right, if it kind of feels tense, you feel you get tense or whatever. Uh, yeah? Allow these things to happen naturally. This is kind of thing. If you're very tired, don't kind of force it straight, straight away. Just chillax, chillax. Okay. And the straightness comes when the mind is ready for it. And then you establish mindfulness in front of them. Yeah. So then you establish mindfulness in front of you. And you will notice this is kind of a very, very important point that is very often not followed by meditators around the world. Before you watch the breath, first comes the establishment of mindfulness. Yeah, that comes first. And mindfulness is not established by focusing on the breath. The mindfulness is established in, by other means. Yeah, and this is a really fundamental point because if you try to watch the breath and you haven't got enough mindfulness, you will not enjoy it. It will not be happy. It will be a bit tense. It will force your mind. The mind wants to do other things. The mind does not want to watch the breath. Yeah? The mind wants to <laughs> fantasize about uh, uh, whatever uh, in, in the world or think about things. That's what the mind often wants to do. And then you have to use willpower. And then that becomes very painful and unpleasant. So establishing mindfulness is, comes first. In front of them, parimukkang, sat, uh, satting parimukkang upatapetva is the Pali word, the Pali phrase here. Uh, parimukkang means something like in front of you. It's kind of a bit vague what that means, but it means like basically here, yeah, in this space, in this time, in the presence, in your own presence. So how do we establish that mindfulness? And these are the things that I've been trying to kind of cultivate in this um, during this course, uh, the idea of how to establish that mindfulness, uh, I haven't really been saying anything at all about watching the breath, you will have noticed. Uh, and it's been talking about everything else. And that is because that is the preliminary. Get that right, then the mindfulness of breathing is pretty much automatic. Yeah? So what is that establishing a mindfulness? Well, it is these qualities yeah, of relaxing, of letting go, uh, of reflecting on the world in such a way that you do let go, uh, bringing up a sense of enjoyment in the here and now. Yeah? These are the things that establish mindfulness. And that's why I've been talking about them. Uh, two main things, two main principles for establishing mindfulness. One is letting go. And the other one is bringing up a sense of gladness or brightness in the mind. These are the two main qualities that are required. Uh, and that's what we are trying to do uh, during meditation. But to be able to do that during meditation, to bring up that uh, letting go and the uh, happiness or whatever, to be able to do that, uh, you have to have done this also in your ordinary life. Yeah? Otherwise, it won't happen when it actually, when you come to meditation. And uh, what, what does this refer to in ordinary life? Well, when you, again, when you read about Satipatthana, Satipatthana says, as I mentioned before, is always founded on two things, Sila and Ujjukaditi. And sila is the part which gives rise to joy and happiness because you feel good about yourself. Ujjukaditi is what gives rise to letting go. Why? Because when you see things clearly, you let go of the nonsense and you focus on what matters. That's why these two things are the two critical things to make meditation matter. So if you want to spend your life in a way that supports meditation practice, this is what you have to do. Sila, 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 sila. 
crossing the road. Okay, look left, look right. Don't walk in when those cars are coming, yeah? Because you're going to die here. Actually, worse than dying, as I mentioned before. Huh? Look left, what, look right. What should I do? Should I say this? No, shut up. Don't talk now. You're feeling kind of, you know, the mind is not in the right state for talking. Huh? What should I do in this case? Uh, what is the right thing to do? What is the right way to think even? Uh, am I really thinking right now? This thinking doesn't seem wholesome. How can I think differently? Huh? And then you think differently. You are about to cross the road. You're making an important decision every time you're going to uh, do anything at all, really. Huh? So this is how the sila comes about. You make this the critical part of your life. Uh, how can I be maximum kind in my life? Yeah? How can I be a kind person? Someone who uh, is a brightness and a joy to the world. Yeah? Someone who other people likes to be around. Someone who kind of brings an additional spark to the existence of humanity. Yeah? How, can I, <laughs> how can I be such a person? Yeah? This is kind of the idea here. Yeah? And, uh, and don't even worry if you are a spark to humanity. Actually, what other people think about you is irrelevant. Uh, if you worry too much about other people, then you will never really become truly virtuous uh, because your virtue becomes trying to please others. And that will always be uh, not really, not, so, sometimes that just makes the virtue doesn't really work out properly if you do that. Uh, I mean, some degree of pleasing others is inevitable, yeah, because we have to function in society, we have to function in social networks. So some degree of that is fine. Don't try to overcome that completely because that's impossible. But to try to make your virtue largely independent of the idea of pleasing others. Uh, yeah, Do things because they are right. Uh, don't do them because other people will praise you or whatever. Uh, then you are on the right track. Yeah. So that is the idea of virtue. Make that really fundamental in your life. This is the most important point of all. Yeah, Live really well. Live to the maximum of your ability. Yeah? And then comes the other side of things, the Ujju Kaditi, the straightening out of the view, the right view. And this is what the first part of the retreat was all about, Yeah, how to get that straight view. Huh? Those of you who were not there on the first part, uh, you have missed out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> There's only a few of you, not so many, huh? but you missed out on a little bit of that. Uh, so that is all recorded, so you can probably get hold of it later on. Uh, um, but uh, So that is the Ujrakaditi, understanding what really has value in this world, uh, what is worthy of, uh, you know, worthy of uh, our refuge, uh, what is worthy of focusing on, uh, what actually, um, how we should kind of direct our mind. Yeah? This is the fundamental, um, fundamental aspect of meditation. So these are the two things that allows you to establish mindfulness uh, uh, in the long run now. Uh, and also in the short run. Huh? So, um, yes. So that is uh, the establishing of mindfulness. Uh, yeah. Um, then what? Once mindfulness is established, I guess the first question is, how do you know if mindfulness is established? How do you even know this? Because uh, you may think, uh, you know, how do you... When should you start watching the breath? When should you kind of just sit, sit back and chillax and enjoy it? What, what exactly should you, uh, you know, what is the sequence here? And very often, and this is something I learned from Ajahn Brahm, and it's a very nice way of thinking about meditation practice. Uh, actually, you never really go to the breath. You just wait for the breath to arrive. You wait for the breath to come to you. Uh, and that means that there is minimum doing, minimum agency, minimum, you know, trying to make the process happen. Instead, you just wait, you wait, you wait, and you enjoy it all the, all the time, allowing the process to happen. And when the breath is suddenly there, because the breath is always there in a sense, it's never very far away, yeah? It comes and goes a little bit. And then when the breath is there, well, then you are doing mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? And then the breath disappears a little bit because of whatever you are, kind of, you're you not letting go enough or whatever, and then it comes back again. Yeah? And you make it very simple, yeah? You can, if you want to, if you want to feel that you can't really get hold of the breath at all, uh, you can sometimes try to do the counting of the breath. Uh, the idea of counting the breath is something found in the Visuddhi Magga. Visuddhi Magga is this, uh, uh, the most famous of all the commentaries on the Pali Canon. It's called the Visuddhi Magga. And this is one of the ways it recommends you to be, enable you to do the breath meditation. So you count the breath. Uh, one, two, uh, no, two. <laughs> You can count it either in breath, both in breath and out breath, or you can just count the out breath depending on what you what you feel like. Yeah. Probably best just to count only one there, uh, two, yeah, and then you go on like that. And that actually 
when you do that, when you count the breath, it takes a little bit more effort. And that's why it is easy to follow the breath, but it can also be a little bit less comfortable for the, exactly for the same reason. So uh, try, try out a few of these different things and see, see what happens. Uh, So, um, uh, yeah, and uh, again, as I mentioned before, one of the strange things is that if your mindfulness really is reasonably strong, yeah, then just waiting, 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 waiting yeah, will gradually clarify the mindfulness more and more. Yeah, because you are aware, it's like things are just happening on the screen, yeah, and, things are, and you don't hold on to them because you're mindful, there's no grasping. Yeah, because there's no grasping, it, things just arise and pass away. They don't leave any imprint in your mind. This is kind of the idea here, no imprint. And so you just sit back and are aware. You're rising and passing away, arising and passing away. Sounds, thoughts, whatever it might be. And then gradually they become fainter and fainter and fainter. And fainter. Mindfulness arises. And then the whole process kind of happens in this way. This is the ideal um, how many people have enough mindfulness to do this? It's, it's hard to say. You have to just check these things out yourself. And then gradually, uh, hopefully this will happen. So now let's come on to the actual practice. Now we assume that mindfulness is established sufficiently. Yeah. Then what happens next? Just mindful, they breathe in. Mindful, they breathe out. Yeah. Once you mindfulness is established and breathing just happens, and uh, mindful, they breathe in, or not just not mindful, just mindful. It says there, yeah. Sat, satova, sato is sati, sato satova. Va is like just, yeah, just mindful. Does how much emphasis should we kind of place on little words like that? Do they have do they have a lot of meaning? Sometimes they may have a little bit of meaning. It's one shouldn't place too much emphasis on tiny little words like that. But sometimes they may have a little bit of meaning. Yeah? And in this case, the idea of just, what I take it to mean, is that you are just mindful. You don't do anything. Yet. You don't force your mind on the breath. You don't use your willpower. You are just mindful. And when you are just mindful, the breath is there. Yeah. So you are doing kind of the mindfulness of breathing meditation as a consequence. So sometimes these little words can have meaning. Yeah? And one of the kind of the remarkable things, one of the beautiful things about the suttas, uh, the Buddha says that the suttas are svakato. Svakato dam, yeah, uh, Svakato, how does it go again? Svakato dam, dammo, dhamma, dammo, dammo, anyway, the dhamma is Svakato, right? Uh, it's amazing how easily the mind gets confused. Uh, and um, anyway, Svakato dammo, so the dhamma is well explained, well proclaimed. Su akato, akato is proclaimed. Su is well, uh, yeah, Su is not a woman's name, it's a, it's a, it means well in Pali. There's do and su. Yeah, do is bad, su is well. That's why you have sukkha, dukkha. Yeah, dukkha is bad. Sukkha is better than, better than bad. So sukkha is good. And so you have su and do. Yeah? And so svakato is actually su plus akato means well proclaimed. And very often the way the Buddha talks about the fact that it is well proclaimed is that the, uh, the, the, the phrases are well chosen, they are meaningful, they are well phrased, there is nothing superfluous in the teachings of the Buddha. He says that specifically in the Pasadika Sutta, we should do the Pasadika Sutta, Bobby, where are you? There, there you are. <laughs> Pasadika Sutta, we should do one day. Yeah? So what, what do we have now? We have, uh, uh, <laughs> we have a few things you can dot down. And uh, so Pasadika, that's a really nice sutta. And Ajahn Brahm always uh, praises this one. So out of my confidence in Ajahn Brahm, I should, but for that reason alone, we should do the Pasadika sutta. And uh, that says, uh, the Buddha talks about, there's nothing superfluous in the Dhamma. Yeah, there's nothing additional in the Dhamma. Everything is actually well spoken, uh, nor is there anything missing. Uh, yeah, that everything is there. So you can't chuck something out. You, you can't add it. You don't need, not need to add anything. Uh, nor can you subtract anything. Everything is just right. And of course, that is very, very significant for how we think about the Buddhist teachings. You don't need to read the Abhidhamma, right? The Abhidhamma is... <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. It's, very, it's terrible. You are giving me this nice coffee, and then I kind of make these terrible jokes about the Abhidhamma. That's really bad, isn't it? <laughs> but the point still remains that it is not actually required. 
the suttas, there's nothing missing in the suttas. They are complete in their own right. And the Abhidhamma is really just like a commentary on the suttas. And it doesn't necessarily add anything all that useful. So nothing is, nothing is missing, nor is anything superfluous. You can't chuck things out. And so what that means is that when you read the suttas of the Buddha, you read them very carefully. Yeah, you read, you take every word into account. What does it actually mean? And every word may have a specific meaning in the suttas. Let's just like here, eva quite likely means just. Yeah. So if it is there from the very beginning, which I think it probably was, it is actually meaningful. And so you, you read the suttas and you take great care, especially as a translator, you take great care to make sure you bring out the whole and the full meaning of what is there. You had to think very carefully, what did the Buddha actually mean when he said this? It is not enough to just translate word by word. That's not how you should translate at all. You should translate according to meaning. What is the Buddha trying to say? If you translate word by word, very often the meaning does not come out properly. But if you try to understand what is going on, then you can actually get the meaning out. This is such an important principle of, of translation. And so you take care when you read, just mindful, okay, what does just mean? Ah, it means mindful, nothing else probably. So that too has meaning. So um, just mindful, then what? Breathing in heavily, they know I am breathing in heavily. Breathing out heavily, they know I'm breathing out heavily. <laughs> so, um, so that's the dukkha, dukkha arising here. <laughs> so thank you for thank you for telling. That's good. Huh? So, um, breathing out heavily, they know I'm breathing out heavily. Yeah, this is the first part. Now we are coming to the very beginning of the Anapanasati Sutta. This is how it begins. Let's just read the first four of the 16 steps first as, as we to start out with them. Breathing in lightly, they know I'm breathing in lightly. Breathing out lightly, they know I'm breathing out lightly. They practice like this. I will breathe in experiencing the whole body. They practice like this, I will breathe out, experiencing the whole body. They practice like this, I will breathe in, stilling the physical process. They practice like this, I will breathe out, stilling the physical process. These are the first four steps of the Anapanasati Sutta out of 16. And the first four steps, they are equivalent to Kaya Nupassana, the contemplation of the body in the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah, or in, I shouldn't say Satipatthana, so I should say in, in Satipatthana, because Satipatthana is much more than just the Satipatthana Sutta. So this is equivalent to that. So if you practice these four steps, you are fulfilling uh, the body contemplation of Satipatthana. So what does all this mean? Let's go back to the beginning again here. So breathing in heavily, then no, I'm breathing in heavily. Digang is the Pali word here, translated as heavily. Diga actually means long. That's really the kind of literal meaning here. Uh, so here, Bhante Sujato is thinking, what is the usual English idiom? Yeah, do we say long breath and short breath, or do we say heavy breath and light breath? Uh, so here, I guess his reckoning is that it's more common in English to talk about the heavy breath and the light breath, and not so common to talk about the long and the short uh, so whatever, you get the idea, yeah? The heavy breath is often long, and the long breath is often more heavy, so it, it kind of makes, makes sense in that particular way. So you start off, and very often when we start off in meditating, you're kind of relaxing, and, and the breath becomes kind of long, yeah? Long and quite, uh, quite clear. You're already quite relaxed, uh, the breath is quite long. Yeah? And so you are aware of that breath. Uh, but then as you relax more, the meditation deepens, the breath becomes shorter. Yeah? You need less oxygen because you're relaxing or whatever, so the breath shortens a little bit. And so this is the second part here. Lightly is like the short breath. Rasa, rasa is short. Diga and rasa. And so this is the starting point. Um, so what does that mean? Does it mean that we try to breathe long and then we try to breathe short? It's quite common in the Buddhist circles to think that this is like something you control. You control the breath this way or that way. 
that is not really the point, yeah? As it says, again, this is why that first instruction is so important. Just mindfully breathe in, just mindfully breathe out. It is not about controlling, it is about being aware of what is going on. And the natural process of the breath is at first it is long, and then it is short. It just shows what happens naturally when you breathe. It just doesn't show you what you are supposed to make the breath into this. But this is just the nature of the breath that goes in this sequence. Yeah, so it is long and then it is short. This is a natural awareness. So what does it mean to be aware? Does it mean that you are kind of knowing the breath is long breath, long breath, long breath, short breath, short breath? Not really. Yeah, It doesn't mean that you label the breath. Labeling is, is not really what you find in the suttas at all. It is more just about knowing the breath. And that knowing, initially, the breath will be long. So what you know, what you are knowing is a long breath, because that's just what is there. It doesn't mean you focus specifically on it, but that is what the awareness is. And after a while, that awareness goes over to being aware of short breath, because that is what is there, because the breath gets shorter. So it's a natural knowing of what is present. That is really all it means. Yeah, it doesn't mean any specific focusing on long or short or whatever. This means you know what is there. You know the breath, basically. That's what it is. So, again, how do we know this breath? Do we, where do we know it? Do we know it in the abdomen? Do we know it on the tip of the nose, on the upper lip? Do we know it in the chest? Do we know it in front of us? Do we know it in outer space? Do we know it in the middle of the head? Do we know it in the... What, how do we know this? And it's a strange thing. The more you read about various kinds of meditations as they're taught by various people, they talk about this in all kinds of ways. Uh, yeah? There's quite a famous uh, Thai meditation master talks about knowing the breath kind of in the middle of your brain, basically, and kind of in your head. So, it's kind of, so you have all of these kind of strange ideas. And, uh, but but parimukkang here really just means something like in front of you, yeah? in the here and now. And it's not really body contemplation. So it doesn't have to be anywhere particular on the body. And so I always liked Ajahn Brahm's instruction. And that was just, you just know the breath. Forget about the body. If you close your eyes, you can kind of know the breath, yeah? Without really focusing on the body as such. Long breath, short breath, yeah? Whatever it is. You know it is there. And you don't have to relate it to anywhere in the body. It is breath meditation. It's not body meditation. Uh, and so you stay with the breath. That's the idea. The reason why many people say that you should know it on the tip of the nose or the upper lip uh, is because that is what the commentaries say. Uh, the commentaries say nas aga. Nas aga. Nas. Nose. Yeah. Same word. Uh, nasa. Nose. How do they say nose in Malay? Okay. No good. Okay. I didn't work. <laughs> So, <laughs> very often they find the same word, right? But this this case is not the same word at all. Yeah. yeah. Nafas. Ah, okay. That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that may be some kind of uh, some uh, movement there in meaning across. Yes. Yeah? So that's kind of fascinating. Anyway, so nasa is the same word as English nose. In Norwegian, it's neas. In, uh, in German, what is it in German? Uh, Nese, I think, something like that. In French, what is it? French, en France, I, I don't know, my, my language skills are not that, that great. Uh, I lived in France, as a child, I should know these things. Le, le nez, c'est le nez. Yeah, nez, yeah, same word again. So these are, these are Indo European words, yeah, they cross the board. We find them in Europe, in, in India, everywhere, because it's the same basic word. So, uh, and so, so what is, who is right? Is Ajahn Brahm right or is the commentary right? <laughs> Ajahn Brahm versus the commentary. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, who is right? Uh, and the truth is, I think both are right. Uh, and the, the reason both are right is that you don't really need to focus on the body. You're just aware of the breath. Whatever you see it, you know it's long, you know it's short, you know it, there is a breath. Uh, but uh, very often, if you are very clear about where that awareness happens, uh, very often it does happen actually in the area of the nose, that kind of area. So both are probably right. But I would uh, recommend you just to be aware of the breath, not really focusing on a particular place, uh, because that is not what the sutta says. Uh, and that is really sufficient uh, for you to do the breath meditation. Yeah? Aware of the breath, long or short, uh, just the breath in general. Yeah. Then what? Uh, 
Then, as you carry on, you don't force the breath, you don't do any, have any intention, any willpower behind this. And as you do that, as you allow the breath to be, and you are aware of the breath, the breath becomes more, you, your awareness expands. Yeah? Your awareness expands because your mindfulness becomes stronger. And then this happens. They practice like this. I will breathe in, experiencing the whole body. They practice like this. I will breathe out, experiencing the whole body. Yeah? So, uh, and this is because your awareness expands. So you can see more. The whole body here is sabbakaya patisang vedi. Experiences patisang vedi. Sabbakaya is the whole body. So what does body mean? Now, it is important to understand that the word kaya does not mean body in the ordinary sense. It does not refer to the physical body. The word kaya really refers to any kind of a group of phenomena coming together. So any body of phenomena coming together. And in this case, body actually refers to the breath. Yeah? And later on in the sutta, we won't see this because I haven't included it here. It specifically says that the, bod the breath is one body among bodies. So the breath is called the body. Yeah, it's a body of phenomena, group of phenomena coming together. This is the breath. Uh, so we're talking about whole body here. We are talking about, uh, yeah, I say, the, whole, the, the breath. Yeah, because it's breath meditation. So it makes sense that this is the whole body of the breath. Uh, so you experience the whole body. It means that you are aware of more of the breath. Uh, you see the breath more. You're not just aware of kind of the breath is going in or out. A very simple awareness. Uh, you have a more awareness of the whole thing, the whole experience of breathing. Yeah? So your awareness is expanding, mindfulness becoming more powerful. Yeah? And this is already quite, it's already pleasant. Yeah? This is the remarkable thing about this meditation. Very quickly, it becomes pleasant and agreeable, especially when your awareness expands. It means you're really with the object now. You're really with what is going on. Distraction is down to minimum already. Not much thinking going on. Yeah? This feels really already feels very powerful and, and beautiful, uh, this kind of uh, uh, experience. You will notice that here it says, they practice like this. Before it just said, they know. Yeah? What, why the difference? And the difference is that uh, they know because that is an immediate knowledge because you're following the breath, uh, but it takes a while for you to be able to see the whole breath. Uh, and so that's why you have to practice for a while doesn't mean that you should do anything. It just means it takes a while for the uh, body, things to calm down, and for the uh, mindfulness to expand sufficiently. Uh, so it expands. Uh, so this is what I say. Some people say here that the whole body means the whole physical body. I think that's a mistake, yeah, and I don't think so. Um, um, all the people I respect the most says, says it means the breath. The commentary says it means the breath. The sutta itself seems to say it means the breath. It says that further down. Ajahn Brahma says it means the breath. Um, so there are some people who say it doesn't mean the breath, but never mind. <laughs> um, the, yeah. So, but uh, I think the point is that even if you focus on the whole body at this particular point, as long as the meditation evolves, as long as you're getting more peaceful, as long as there is uh, an evolution in the mindfulness, uh, it's still actually okay. Yeah. But uh, ideally, I would say, it's just the breath meditation. I mean, it's called the Anapanasati Sutta, so it's not clear why you suddenly should become aware of the physical body at this point. Uh, so, whole breath. Uh, then what? They practice like this. Uh, I'll breathe in, stilling the physical process. Uh, they practice like this. I will breathe out, stilling the physical process. So what does this mean uh, the physical process is the kaya sankara. The stilling is pasambati. Pasambati is the same thing as the word pasadi that we have seen before, one of the bojangas. Yeah? And so pasambati means like calming and stilling and tranquilizing. Yeah? So you are tranquilizing the physical process. What is kaya sankara? Kaya sankara is the, like the activity of the body. That's why it calls it physical process here, the activity of the body bodily activity. And of course, bodily activity here is basically the breath. Yeah? That is the activity that you're focusing on. That's what you're seeing in the body. And so the bodily activity basically means the breath is calming down. Yeah? But of course, when the breath is calming down, everything is really calming down. Yeah? 
Yeah, if there is anything else happening in your body, that maybe you can feel your heartbeat a little bit, maybe you can feel your body a little bit, or whatever it is. Everything is calming down. And that's why it is nice to call it the physical process rather than specifying the breath necessarily. Everything is calming down. Yeah, and then it becomes even more delightful. And uh, here you are starting to see one of the uh, things that is uh, uh, the hallmarks of meditation process. And the two things that we will see as we carry on with the meditation, looking at the sutta, is two things you see throughout. The calming process on the one hand, and then the enjoyment process on the other hand. And the calming is already starting at this particular point. Yeah, the calming of the physical process is happening right here. So, uh, yeah, this is one of the critical parts of uh, the... Um, uh, what meditation is all about. Uh, so that is all you have to do, right? This is all you have to do to do the uh, kaya nupasana, the contemplation of the body. Uh, and so how then does this relate to what we see in the uh, Satipatthana Sutta? In the Satipatthana Sutta, as I mentioned before, they talk about mindfulness of breathing. They also talk about the 31 parts of the body, right? Uh, 31 parts of the body. Is that right? 31 parts? Yeah, so which one do you, what, which one do you prefer? 31 or 32? Huh? What, we... <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, so anyway, so now that's, uh, but anyway, it's 31 parts in the, uh, in the suttas and 32 parts in the Sudhi Magga. And so uh, we should, of course, be following the suttas. Uh, um, but so how does this work together? What are the, what are the kind of the uh, connection between the two? Uh, 31 parts of the body and the mindfulness of breathing. And the connection is that uh, sometimes if you have too much uh, um, attachment to the body, uh, yeah, too much uh, desires or whatever in the body, then you can do the 31 parts of the body to kind of allay that uh, and to make the meditation possible uh, on the breath. Uh, that's really the connection here. Uh, so they kind of go together in this way. One lays, puts aside some of the attachments, uh, and the other one then allows the meditation to happen naturally by following the breath. Uh, so they kind of go together in this way. But it also means you don't have to do the 31 parts of the body. Yeah? It is not actually necessary. All you really have to do is the mindfulness of breathing. So if you're already doing well with that particular meditation, you can stick to that. don't have to do anything else. So. All right, so let's do some meditation again. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, any more, any comments or questions, please? <clears throat> Thank you, Venerable. Um, so uh, I always felt the, the language doing, uh, cultivating, training, practicing, calming, uh, that kind of implied that you're doing something, uh, but obviously we're not doing anything, we're just observing, and all of this happens naturally, the breath calms down. Yeah. Um, so uh, from the first, second step to the third and fourth step that you're aware uh, the breath is long or short, uh, that could be anywhere, could be in front of the nostril, could be in the chest, could be in the abdomen, you're just aware of the breath. Mm. But the third step, you're aware of the entire breath. So kind of element of doing comes in, like I can feel the breath anywhere, but then the doing, because you're following the, are you following the entire path of the breath? That is, you're feeling the breath going through your nostrils, then through your chest, and then abdomen expanding, and then, you know, following the whole process through. So it's kind of sub subtle kind of doing there. So I'm not clear about this. Or you can just be, just be aware. That was one part. Yeah. And the second thing is calming. Yes, in general, obviously, you're looking at breath, the whole body feels very calm. Everything is very calm. Uh, but in general, like because it says, you know, calming the breath, how do you perceive the calmness? Like it's just that you're feeling calm, like it's the whole thing is calm, everything is stilling down. We can experience that. But calming the breath down, you know, like it's not noisy, anyways, to begin with. So, kind yeah. of this, and I have another question. This is one part of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I think when you're, I mean, there's many ways you can experience the whole breath, but uh, 
usually it just means you, you don't you know you don't have to you can follow it in one spot for example uh, all the way yeah like like it's like one this is kind of how it is explained in the commentary it's like when you have a a saw, you're sawing, even though the saw moves back and forth, you're focusing on the spot where the saw hits the wood. So you kind of, you may be focusing on your nostril, you can see the whole breath at that point, because it goes through that point, by that point. So it is just, it, you know, and, and in general also, you can just close your eyes and you have a full awareness of the breath. You don't actually need to locate it all that much physically. There's a general awareness of the breath. Of course, if you start to look, you will see that it relates to the body somehow, but you don't have to make that a main focus. Just a sense of the full breath, yeah? You're aware of the full breath. Yes, the body is there too, but uh, the breath is the main, main attention. So it, whatever, whatever works, basically. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be one way or the other. Uh, uh, when it comes to the idea of uh, calming the breath, uh, um, again, it, it, I would say it happens automatically, uh, yeah? Because if you are aware, if you allow things to be, if you have no desires, you have nothing really going on, uh, it is a natural for the breath to calm down. It becomes peaceful by itself. Uh, you don't really have to do anything. You just stand back and wait. And in fact, I would say that actually is the message from the suttas. Uh, the suttas is that you know, these, pro these are processes, uh, and uh, the less involved you are, uh, the calming, the calming just, uh, just must happen. It's not, it's not something that you, uh, you know, you, and I think the more involved you are, the more it goes in the opposite direction, because the whole point is that uh, the mind, the movement of the mind, uh, is what we are trying to calm. Uh, and if you try to calm it, you're doing the opposite of what you're supposed to be doing because you're actually using the movement of the mind. Uh, yeah, And so the allowing the things to go is actually kind of the critical thing here. Uh, so, And this is, you know, this is why also it's so delightful because that mind which doesn't do, that means that you don't use up any energy, the energy returns to the mind, all of these kind of positive things arise out of that. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, th I think to me that is what it really means. And so even though it says for somebody there, which kind of implies calming, yeah, um, or it, it calms an active process, uh, I think there's very little activity going on. It's more like allowing it to happen rather than anything else. Uh, yeah. The second part was, um, Ajahn, I've always wondered about the walking meditation. Mm. For me, uh, it serves more as kind of gives you some concentration and I can kind of tend to contemplate, reflect, uh, you know, the more of Dhamma which are rather than, you know, actually uh, getting into deeper meditations. So I've often wondered uh, that the Western philosophers like Shaila Katrin, Leigh Brisington and all, they go into jhanas in and out like walking and I, I just kind of, can't get my head around it. Is it like, is it just me? Because, and if uh, uh, walking meditation does not actually lead to profound samadhis, uh, what is actually the use of it? As I said, I just do it for contemplation and maybe yeah. concentrates and calms you down a bit. Uh, but mm. not really, it's not really a profound meditation, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, yes. Um, it, it can, it can be. It can be, I mean, but it depends what you mean by profound. I mean, I, I think that if you say it leads to jhana, I think that is, uh, I, I, I have my doubts, to be honest, about that one. Uh, but it can lead to some nice samadhi, yeah, and it can lead to some very nice peaceful minds that it can lead to joy and happiness. It can take you a, a fairly long way in this process, uh, but I don't think it takes you all the way to samadhi, but it can give you, give you a certain foundation for samadhi. It even says in the suttas that the samadhi that you attain through walking meditation lasts a long time, because precisely because it is associated with movement. It means that the samadhi is more stable once you, you know, when you move around, whereas the sitting meditation, samadhi is very easily disturbed because you are, you know, once you get out of it, you start moving around, the whole, the whole samadhi is disturbed. So it is said to be more lasting when you do it in walking meditation. It has, has a more effect in the long run. Uh, but yes, it is not as, uh, it is not as um, uh, profound as it is in sitting meditation. And I agree. I think that a lot of the time when you, do sitting meditation, you're always trying to calm the mind anyway, you're always trying to achieve samadhi. I think sometimes you need to do something else as well when you come out of it. You can't always be practicing samatha because after, mind, after a while the mind will not want to do it anymore. The mind will kind of want to do something different. Uh, my, the meditation tends to have a certain cycle to it, a natural cycle. You know, you start out, you become more and more peaceful, and then there comes a point when the mind kind of reaches a plateau and then you kind of come out. Uh, and uh, it, I would recommend people to try to follow the natural cycles of the mind uh, rather than trying to uh, create, you know, create things all the time, but forcing the mind to always do samatha. 
So when you come out of the, 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 the sitting meditation, as you say, do something else, do some contemplation, reflect on something. It is always a good opportunity anyway. If you had a nice sit, then your mind will be peaceful. You will have some more ability to go deeper into the matters of impermanence and these kind of things. So you reflect on some of these suttas. You reflect on how does this apply to me? What does it mean in my life, uh, et cetera? Do some death contemplation, do some metta, do whatever. But I agree, do something. I think it's useful to do something different at that particular point. Uh, uh, there is very, there is no, uh, there is no reference in the suttas to the idea of watching your feet when you do walking meditation. It doesn't say that anywhere. This is just like a, a particular interpretation of walking meditation. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else want to say anything? Yes. Hello, Ajahn. Hello. Um, I go back to the uh, contemplation on death. Um, when death occurs, what happened to the three refuges? Mm -hmm. That's the first one. And then the second one, the seven awakening factors. Yeah. How does energy manifest uh, itself, the different forms of uh, manifestation? How, how does energy manifest itself? Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank uh, you. So what happens to the three refuges when you die? Um, you take them with you into the dying process, yeah? Because the, the thing is that the more, uh, the more you take that ref make that refuge real during life now, the more you make it real now, the more it will stay with you when you pass away. Huh? And so, for example, you know, the three refuges, um, uh, it, um, what, what does it mean? Well, it means, for example, that you have a confidence in the Dhamma, for example, confidence in the Buddha, and through the dying process, that uh, joy, that contemplation of the Buddha or the Dhamma or whatever, uh, that can become quite strong because you, you know, now you're giving up everything else. Your mind actually inclines towards more spiritual things because you're giving up the world. So that can actually come, come back to you when, you when you die and can actually become a part of that process when you die. But also then when you are reborn, what happens when you're reborn? Well, what happens when you're reborn is that uh, you will recognize the Dhamma in your next life yeah? because it is deeply embedded in your mind. Uh, yeah? When you come across the Dhamma, it would be, I, what is going on? I recognize this. You can't maybe recognize exactly the words, but you recognize something familiar about this. Yeah? What is it? What is it familiar? And then you start to kind of investigate, and then they kind of gradually, you kind of pick up where you left off in your previous life because you have taken that refuge in the previous life. In particular, you have an understanding of the word of the Buddha and the suttas. And so that understanding will then help you to reestablish it in your next life. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is the... Uh, this is really how it works. So you always bring the refuge with you. The refuge goes with you into the future. The more powerful you make that refuge in this life, uh, the more powerful it will be uh, through the death process and also into your next life as a consequence. Uh, so uh, bojangas, the uh, energy, how does it manifest? It manifests in the mind. The mind feels energized. Uh, it is not, energy is different from effort. Effort is what you do, is what you purposefully, you purposefully put in effort. Uh, it may not come naturally, but you make it happen because you, you, know, you put it in there. Energy is a naturally occurring um, faculty of the mind. The mind has energy. And this is what we're trying to develop, that natural faculty when you do meditation. So the mind feels energized. Yeah? The, how does it manifest? It manifests as brightness of the mind. It often comes with gladness because energy is a glad, positive state. It, it manifests as you feel the mind, the mind feels powerful. It feels like the mind has the ability to do things it didn't have before. It feels like it has a certain power and energy to it. Uh, it has abilities, it has faculties that it didn't exist beforehand. Uh, that's how it manifests. That's how you can see the energy of the mind. Uh, yeah? this is, uh, you feel like a powerhouse after a while. <laughs> we can plug you up to the net. You can take energy onto the net from your mind and you know, light up. What was that? Yeah, okay, okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, all right, any, um, any more questions, anyone? Huh? Everyone is completely content? Okay, we have one at the back there. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Hello, Bhante. Hello. Good morning. Um, okay, um, when you talk about death or contemplation this morning, I think it's peaceful death. Um, okay, what happened was recently one of my friends uh, died uh, in a tragic death. Um, 
he got lost while jungle tracking alone. Okay. Um, <clears throat> he was lost overnight and they found his body the next day. So um, in that kind of state where your mind is very confused, what, what would a, a Buddhist be doing actually? Okay. Um, so I, it struck me. So I was just wondering. Yeah. Thanks. Are you, yes. uh, how, how do you know he was confused? Are you sure he was confused then? <laughs> I think because um, he went into the jungle about 9.30 in the morning, he called his family about 4.30 in the evening to say that he was lost. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, um, I mean, there were search yeah. parties that were sent out, but yeah. he couldn't find him overnight. So he was there overnight. Mm. So <clears throat> okay. I presume he would probably be quite confused and probably okay. tired. But right. post-mortem showed... Uh, the cause of death was quite inconclusive, so okay. I'm not sure what happened. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, it, it, it's strange because it really depends on. Uh, it, it is not necessarily tragic, you know, because uh, I, I mean, it may be tragic for the family who left behind because for them it's difficult. Yeah, they lost their father or husband or whatever, and that's often very difficult. Uh, but not necessarily for the person who dies. <clears throat> it depends on how prepared he was. Uh, depend on the kind of qualities he had. Uh, and even if you felt confused for a while, at the moment you die, often clarity often comes back again. Uh, this is kind of the purpose of the death contemplation, yeah, is that actually you realize I'm going to die. You realize you have no choice. You have to let go when you're going to die, yeah. And because you have to let go, you just do it anyway. Yeah? And this is kind of the idea of bringing that into the present. So knowing that you have to, let, have to die in the future, well, you might as well do it now, so you do it now. And so I think very likely for what, what may have happened to him, I don't know what kind of person he was, uh, but if he was a reasonable, if he was a decent person and a good person, uh, quite likely when he was dying, he would have let go of the world. Yeah? And the moment you let go, mindfulness comes back, uh, confusion is gone, uh, and then you have, a, you have a positive experience as a consequence. Uh, so I think that uh, quite possibly it was not, very, not a very tragic death at all. Uh, Quite possibly, it was a uh, positive experience for him, uh, and I think you know if you want to uh, kind of if you want to um, uh, you know say something nice to the family, you can kind of say that you know probably your you know your dad or your husband or, or your son or whoever it is that is involved, uh, uh, probably you know he was he was okay. I mean you know if you know his character, if you tell them he was a good person. Uh, good people usually have a good death. Uh, probably had a good death. Now he's probably happy. Maybe sitting in the heavenly realm, looking down, saying, get on with your life. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. Yeah? Don't, I, I'm okay. Carry on. And maybe in the future, we will reunite because this is a very common thing. Yeah? You re reunite often after death. Uh, we meet our Lord once again. Uh, and so this can be, always be a, uh, something can, a way of thinking that uh, makes the whole death experience far less traumatic for everyone involved. Uh, something like that. Uh, Do you want to say, say something more, or are you You're looking for the microphone? I, I, I seem like it. Um, no, because I, I don't know whether to believe or not to believe, but apparently uh, the family uh, consulted with some monks, and they said that uh, there were spirits there, and uh, he was affected by the spirits. So uh, later, after his passing, they did some prayer there. So I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but my understanding right. is that even when the Buddhist monks, before they go into the forest for, yeah. they do uh, do spiritual cleansing and yeah. they do provide protection to themselves. Yeah. I'm just wondering. All right. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, people, monks say they are spirits. I don't know on what basis they say that, to be honest. Uh, sometimes they may say it because they think that's the likely thing or, I, or whether it really happened. Uh, I wouldn't take those things too seriously, to be honest. Uh, but even if it was a spirit, uh, you know, that maybe the spirit can cause you to die, but then what? Then you're still, still the same. It's just another cause of death. Whether you die from a spirit or you die from a tra traffic accident, it's just a particular way of dying. It doesn't make that much difference. Uh, and then when your mind is erased from the body, still your mindfulness gets reestablished. Uh, so I don't think that is really, uh, is really very important, uh, one way or the other. Uh, the, the, what matters is whether you're ready for the death process. Uh, and that readiness comes from, depends on your character, what your character is like. Yeah. yeah so if you had a good character, it was probably okay. That's what I reckon. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I think Ajahn, the, the, the crux of the question probably could be like, 
uh, what is the closure? We all, I mean, for, for the people who you leave behind, there's always this this one thing to to have some kind of. Yeah, but the closure is that he was probably okay here. The closure is that he uh, he uh, you know if he was a good person, then good people always have good outcomes. So it is not about how we die or whether we die. We, we're all going to die one way or the other. It is about how we live. That's the important thing here. And if he lived well, he will be okay here. And he probably now is in a good place. Uh, and they should feel happy for him because a good person always has a good future. Uh, that is the right way of thinking about it. Uh, and uh, that's kind of how I thought about it when my own father now, he was a good father. Uh, he lived well. He did, uh, had a good life. So now he's probably okay. So why should I? What, what is there to grieve about? If I grieve, it's only for myself. It's only for my own loss. Uh, but actually, I can look after myself. Uh, I'm all right. I'm a Buddhist monk, for goodness sake. Uh, I'm doing the best thing, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, why, why, there's not much point in grieving here. Uh, and uh, instead of be happy for having had a good dad, father who led you in the right way, who allowed you to become a monk and to do all the right things. Uh, so thank you, dad, for being a good father, for kind of leading things in the right way. That's kind of how I would uh, look at that situation. And then you can have some closure about it. Uh, yeah. yeah, it reminded me of a, a something, you know, somebody close, but not that close, but uh, the, the father... Um, um, one evening, just just uh, just just uh, went into a coma, mm -hmm. and uh, and then of course they rushed him to the hospital, and there was this hospital process, and of course the doctor, the neurosurgeon who came and he, he looked at the brain and he said that there's not much of activity going on. But for the family members, I think the point in time was the decision: how long should he be uh, put on the uh, life support and whatever they, yeah. to keep him going, because from a from his breathing. But the brain has sort of stopped entirely. There's not acti no activity going on up there. Yeah, and yeah. then I think the family members were having this dilemma as, as to should yeah. I should I pull the plug? Should I not do things like that? And then I think they had this 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 rumination for a few days. Yeah, uh, and this this changing hospital, consulting doctors, and making and it's something that kind of pain that they have to go through in that process. And then that, that day, I think I heard from the daughter and she says that was the day they decided to pull. Uh, it, was, it was difficult for them because they, it's like they are taking, taking away his life and they still have hope for him to, to come back alive. Yeah. And then, uh, then the, that morning they made a decision. That's the morning he stopped breathing. Okay. <laughs> so I, so I, okay. I told the daughter that, uh, yeah. that uh, you know, your, your, your father probably made a decision for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I was just, just yeah. reminded of the story. That's a nice story. Yes, that's good. And I think that's often exactly what happens, you know. They, uh, they, uh, we have this kind of, uh, we have a connection that goes beyond, uh, beyond these things. So, uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, all right. So, uh, okay. 